The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 774 for Monday, August 12th, 2019. <laughs> Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, the cool stuff we've found, all of that stuff, and we mix it together, creating what we like to call an agenda. We follow it loosely ish, <laughs> with the goal being that we are going to all, each individually, together, learn. At least five new things every single week when we get together. Sponsors for this episode include expressvpn.com slash MGG, linode.com slash MGG, and barebones.com. No MGG required there. In fact, don't use it. It'll probably mess up. But you'll go visit those URLs, and then in a little while, we'll talk about each of them as to why you went and visited them already. For now, here in, I guess, Orlando, Florida is better. I, I might not be technically in Orlando, but I, let's say that I am. Here in Orlando, Florida, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, still in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yeah, so I am on the mobile rig. Hopefully the sound works out for all of you and all of that. I guess if you're hearing this, it already does. Uh, I'm here for a podcast movement, uh, a podcast focused conference uh it's actually the fifth one and it's the first one that i have attended uh i've this schedule wise in the summer we've talked about this folks it's tough but uh you know i'm in the business not only do we do the show we have backbeat media and all this other stuff so it makes a lot of sense i think for me to be here and i'm going to find out because the show sort of gets going tomorrow i did a cool thing today that we will talk about in a little bit but we'll get some stuff show stuff out of the way first not out of the way we will do some show stuff first but uh yeah so um that's uh that's where we're at you got anything to say john or should we um should we uh should we oh, just get right into i'll it? talk about my financial adventures yes you have talk about your space talk adventures about. True. that's so. right yeah for sure for sure all right let's uh Let's see if we can get some questions done here. Lawyer Jeff, actually, we're going to do some cool stuff found because we know you love cool stuff found. And Lawyer Jeff is going to start us off. He says, TJ Luoma was on Mac Power Users and mentioned a utility called Bailiff, which is from the Eclectic Light Company, a company, uh, Howard Oakley's site, where he not only pontificates and shares a wealth of great information, he also shares some apps that he's written Bailiff is a menu bar control app that lets you control whether iCloud documents are kept in local storage or just on iCloud. So that's pretty good, right? You know, we can set it, we can set iCloud to download everything or not, but beyond that, Apple doesn't give us any granular control. Bailiff does. So we will put a link to that in the show notes, of course. And then uh, Jeff says, while checking out Bailiff, I found yet another interesting app from the same place called Cirrus, C-I-R-R-U-S, which takes control of iCloud, investigates and diagnoses its problems. He says it's not currently working on the Catalina beta, but, uh, but of course, we will put uh, a link in the show notes to both of these things because, the, well, after all, that's, that's what we do. Any uh, any thoughts on this, Mr. Braun? Uh, not right now, but uh, okay. a few questions down. Uh, cool. I'm going to mention that, that there are a ton of good apps. That that guy is, is nuts, man. He, I know. Now, there's so many useful things here to let you uh, l- let you look underneath the covers. Uh, a lot of them. Yeah. Right now, what what's your Mac doing, man? Yeah. No, like iCloud, good. especially. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's like a what? What is it? Oh, what, what do they call it? A nest of. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it was uh, it, it, like stay away from it, like a swarm of bees or something, right? Right, that right. Was, there was an article that I think has been deprecated, but they were yeah. like, "Don't touch this directory, man." Uh, he right. touched it, and uh, and it looks like uh, it's working out. 
Yeah, leave it. Right. That's right. Well, Howard is one of the, I mean, he's a special one. He knows what he's doing. So, all right. So let's, uh, let's see if we can go to Chris here. Uh, Christopher, my apologies, who says, hmm, let's see. Does he say yes? Okay. Uh, he says, Regarding Jed's question in the last episode, 773, I have a cool stuff found to share. I recommend using NeoFinder from cdfinder.de as his disk cataloging software. He says, I've used it for years to catalog not only my internal hard drive, but also all those removable drives that you have stacked around your desk and locked in your safe deposit box, etc. He says, you do have a current backup of your important documents on a hard drive in your safe deposit box, don't you? The software creates a nice database of your drives and helps to find that file document project image sound file wherever it might reside. Just remember to label the outside of those external drives so you know which one to mount. So, yeah, very cool. Thank you for that, Christopher. Good stuff. Anything uh, to share on that one, my... Uh my friend, Mr. Braun. No. Okay. Let's keep rolling. Man. All right. Well, we'll roll, yeah, we'll roll through some of these. Ben shares. Uh, he says with the demise of dashboard coming in Mac OS Catalina, I've been looking for replacements for my cherished widgets. I've already transitioned from June clouds, note file to notes and started using the lookup gesture instead of the dictionary widget. I'm also prepared to replace calculator stocks and delivery status with their notification center equivalents. I went looking for a way to show uptime. That is the amount of time that your system has been running since it was last rebooted. Uh, he says, I went, I found, I wanted, wanted, I went looking for a way to do this in notification center. And I discovered something called today scripts by a random Reddit user. It runs invisibly and very easily displays the results of any terminal command in notification center as a widget. Very cool stuff. And he asks, are y'all dashboard fans? And if so, what are you sad to lose? And what have you found to replace it? If you have an answer for either of those parts of that question or both of them, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is where you will go to share that with us. I don't know if I heard you right over the hotel Wi-Fi there, Dave. But did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I did. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I, I did. That's kind of how it works. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Don't you think? Uh, I think it's great. Yeah, it's good. In all seriousness, though, the Wi-Fi is working for you. You're you're good. You would you yeah. would actually yeah. let me know if there was a problem. Okay, good. I I, I, I heard you flange. You flanged a little bit at one point, but uh, other than that, no, it seems to uh, be keeping up. That actually may be the audio processing fighting with the air conditioner on my end, not on your end this time. So that's possible. It's possible. We flange sometimes. That's how it works. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? Chuck. Chuck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck has a great little option. We were talking about removing space uh, on your iOS device. In fact, listener Scott, I think, was the one that, that shared a tip for how to... Um, he, he, I guess he uh, wiped his phone... And then restored it from a backup and got like 14 gigs back, which is great. <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't have to be that way. And uh, Chuck has found, if I can even see it, well, so the the PDF is broken. That's fine. Uh, I, thankfully, I prepped this show right before we did it. And I remember that Chuck said he has found email to be the thing that uses up a lot of space on iOS when you load an email it saves a local copy as like a cache and oftentimes ios doesn't get rid of these things when you might want it to what he has done is gone in and removed the email account from ios's settings and then just re-add it and that way it wipes out the uh the the cache without uh having to wipe the the phone now if that's the case that is new behavior from my standpoint because i have done this before i've removed an email account because it was doing other funky things and i've added it back and it 
finds the same local cash that was there before. The only way I've found it, uh, it, it, you can not see the cash of an email account is to use a different mail server name. So it stores the cash in a folder, just like it does on Mac OS with say uh, username at email server. So let's say, you know, Dave Hamilton at gmail.com. I don't recommend you email that address. You can, it will get to me, but you'll also get a, a, an auto replier saying you probably didn't reach the Dave you're looking for. You in fact would have, but Dave Hamilton at gmail.com. There is a cache on my device that, that checks that account and the folder is named that same thing. It's like IMAP dash Dave Hamilton at gmail.com. I've deleted an account like that from iOS, put it back on and it's found the cache because it didn't delete the cache when I deleted the account. Hopefully now Chuck is right and it deletes that cache. But the only way I've, I've been able to get around it is to create a new account and use say Dave Hamilton at Google mail.com as the mail server name. And then that creates a new cache. Not every mail server has a secondary server name. So, you know, there you go. And it might have been Dave Hamilton at imap.gmail.com because it saves it with the inbound mail server. And I changed it to Dave Hamilton at imap.googlemail.com. So you can do that with Gmail. Uh, imap.gmail.com is the same as imap.googlemail.com and smtp.gmail.com is the same as smtp.googlemail.com. But I hope Chuck is right that deleting the email account now deletes that cash folder because that would be a very good thing. So thoughts, my, uh, my friend, Mr. Braun. Nice. You know, I was looking at iMazing to see if iMazing would let you manage that. And it uh, doesn't appear that it does. Yeah. I don't think it can touch that, but what iMazing of course can do is let you restore from your backup and do so selectively. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is you could not, you know, restore that stuff. So, yeah. It's craziness, though, Mr. Braun. That's the um, that's what I say. I, I really wish iMazing could or that Apple, for example, would share a tip that, you know, or share a, a, a utility that could do that sort of thing. So we have uh, a few quick tips to go through. But, John, first, I want to talk about our first sponsor, if that's all right by you, my friend. Of course. All right, sweet. Our first sponsor today is ExpressVPN, where, as I mentioned, you can visit expressvpn.com slash MGG to find out how you can get three months for free with a one-year package. I'm traveling today. I was at NASA today. I had to use NASA's Wi-Fi at times. I know we all love NASA, but I don't necessarily trust what they're going to do with my data. I certainly don't want them seeing my data because who knows what they might do with that. So I used ExpressVPN on my phone and on my laptop to know for certain that my data is tunneled and secure and it's mine. Because ExpressVPN doesn't just encrypt your data while you surf. It lets you stream and access content that might have been blocked. Who knows? Maybe NASA blocks like Gmail, just like we were talking about. I don't know, but it wouldn't have mattered to me because I was using ExpressVPN. Once I got that tunnel created, it doesn't matter because everything goes through that tunnel and then I can do what I want and I'm not limited by whatever the firewalls want to do or whatever filters and all that stuff. It runs in the background of your computer or your phone and then you just use the internet like you normally would. You download the app, you click to connect, and it's super easy. It's just like one click and boom. I never go online while traveling without using ExpressVPN, and you shouldn't either. It's super fast. Like, I've, I've tested it with speed tests on my home connection, which is super fast. It's great. It's seven bucks a month, and it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. You've got to check this out. No matter what you're trying to browse online, ExpressVPN gives you instant access all over the world. Don't travel anywhere this summer without downloading ExpressVPN. And as I said, you can do it. Visit expressvpn.com slash MGG today to protect your online activity and find out how you can get three months for free. That's E X P R E S S VPN.com slash MGG for three months free with a one year package. Thank you so much to ExpressVPN for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. 
All right, Mr. Braun, are you going to take us to uh, Keith now? Yeah. First off, I'm glad about ExpressVPN because that came in very handy at some of the trips we took because certain people block certain things. Exactly. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I know. It's but, uh, And it's great to have it. Yeah. yeah it's awesome. So, so cool. anyways, um, yeah, let's go to, uh, I think we got a, a good quick tip here, which is relevant because I've had this happen to me. But um, Keith says... Like many people, I've never really seen the point of live photos and have the option turned off on my camera. My opinion may have changed, but only under certain circumstances. A friend took some pictures of me yesterday and airdropped them over. In a couple of them, I had my eyes closed, but I noticed they were live photos. I tapped edit and then used the slider at the bottom. I was able to select a frame with my eyes open. I tapped make key photo and save the picture. Sort it. As a bonus, it's also possible in the edit screen to turn off live so you only so you get only the single frame visible. This works in photos in OS 10 as well as iOS. So thank you, Keith. And and I had this happen on our, our recent trip, Dave. Um, I asked someone to take a, a photo of me. Um, it was me making a certain gesture in front of a certain building, and that's all I'm going to say. Um, but anyways, I guess the person did not know the... Um, intricacies of taking a picture and held down. I believe to get a live photo, you hold down the the uh, button. No, you just you just mode. have your you just have your uh, your phone take live photos. It's a it's an option across the top. You may be confusing this with burst mode, perhaps. Uh, uh, live live photos <laughs> and burst mode are similar in this regard, where you 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 wind up with very a very similar thing in the end, where you've got this you know in in burst mode, you have a burst of pictures and live photos. You, you kind of have the same thing. It's just treated like a video, uh, a very short video. But um, but the same net effect for what, what Keith is talking about here works in both of those cases. Yeah. So wait, how did they take a live photo of me then? They probably huh. tapped the live photo button. It's the little circle ah, thing at the top okay. of the camera app on your phone. I see. Yes. Okay. You're right. Yeah, I see it here. And right now it has a line through it. But uh, Right. But if ah. you tap it, it, it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's super handy for exactly what Keith is talking about. I, I mm-hmm. the only thing is, I, and and I, I I'm gonna say this. I'm and I'm probably wrong, but I'll say it anyway. It seems like when I'm taking live photos, if I'm taking lots of photos in succession, my phone needs to sort of catch up every now and then. That may be something going on with my phone though, because. I actually have a quick tip to share that that I will I will share when we're done with this. But my phone was acting up today. It's been acting up a lot lately. In fact, I probably need to do the nuke and pave restore little thing. But with all my travel, I don't want to do that. Well, so, yeah, you know. I think I saw you write that it got wedged, and you had to figure out how to unwedge it. <laughs> I did have to figure out how to unwedge it. Yes, yeah. So um, I I as I mentioned, I think I mentioned I did I did mention. Uh, I was at NASA today touring around and, and we visited uh, some crazy things. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but at our first stop, we're seeing a Saturn V rocket. Really cool. I took some pictures. Now I'm listening to a guy talk and I, I, one of the docents there was talking and I wanted to take a picture and I pull out my phone and I see the spinning gear on the screen. I'm like, oh <laughs> crap. Spinning gear of despair. Yeah. It's like of all the freaking times for this to happen right now seriously my laptop is on the bus my my ipad is on the bus you know and i could have gone out to the bus but it would have been required like ask it was you know we're at nasa so there's some well, regimented well, sometimes, things yeah but sometimes that means that it's rebooting what do they call it again yeah rebooting uh, springboard the presentation layer. Yeah. yeah Springboard. Okay. Yeah. So, so sometimes you recover from it, but sometimes you don't. That's what I figured. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll listen to this guy talk. And after five minutes, you know, it'll have finished whatever it's doing. 20 minutes later, we're going out to the bus. It's still doing its thing. Now, in the meantime, I've tried. I know because we talked about it on this show. I know that there's a way to force an iPhone 10 to stop being powered on. And I can't remember it for the life of me. And I remember when we talked about it on the show, I said, go do this on your phone so you get some muscle memory with it. Because when you need to do it, you're going to need to know how to do it. And you're going to want to remember. So I'm there having a moment, remembering, talking together with all of you. And of course, I can remember talking about it, but I can't remember the thing. I knew it involved all three buttons. 
but I couldn't remember the order. So I'm like trying different things and I'm still trying to like soak in everything that we're doing there and not really stress about it. Cause I knew I had my iPad with the mint mobile SIM in it on the bus. And I figured, okay, I can look it up when we get on the bus. So when it was time to leave, I was the first one back on the bus. I whipped out my iPhone or my iPad and, uh, you know, my iPhone's still going in the mode. It's hot, you know, cause it's just running and like, oh, great. This, I'm burning up my battery at the beginning of this long day where I'm going to want to take pictures and do all sorts of things and record people. But I looked it up and I got it to work. I, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to share any of the things that I tried because I don't want you or me to misremember any of these things. But suffice to say, I tried everything except the right combination. So I will tell you what the right combination was. And after I did this, the phone powered down, powered back up and everything's been fine since. The combination is press the volume up button, release it, press the volume down button, release it, press and hold the button on the other side until the phone powers down. And it took all of about five seconds. So here's how I am choosing to remember this. No button is pressed with any other button. So you're only ever pressing one button at a time and you're only holding one button in only one, not multiples. So you're not holding a button and it's just press, release, press, release and hold. And you start with volume up. So it's volume up, volume down, press and hold the other side button. Boom, you're good to go. So hopefully that helps at least one of us remember, because that's a valuable thing to know how to do. <sighs> Frustrating. But thankfully, it, you know, I was able to get through it and all was good. Yeah. And that was it was on my iPhone 10R, but that works with any any non home button iPhone is really what it is. So 10 and, and later in that in that lineup so good john anything uh on that so we move on to so i have an eight so i would do the same thing but the last step would be to hold down my home button because i have one is that right is that how you do it with that one is it also involve the volume buttons i didn't think it did i thought you held like home and the side button on the iphone on the iphones with a home button and that did it Thought it was that that was that was what threw me off was it used to be that you would hold home and the side button and then that would force the phone to power down. Uh, I believe that's correct. Maybe somebody in the chat room at macgeekab.com slash stream. Uh, and uh, and there you go. So, yeah, that's not working for me at the moment, but I shouldn't be fiddling with that. So anyways, but I don't want to misinform people. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Brian Moreau in the in the room is saying that's home. correct, but I just want to make sure we get that right. So, uh, but I, I think it is power and home. Michael King is also saying, yeah, power and home at the same time. So, we're calling that third button the power button. So, yeah, there you go. Huh? It's not doing anything. Ah, like because eight, the but- iPhone seven and eight don't have the physical home button. So, you, I think you're right. I think you're right, John. It is the same right. It would have to be the same scenario. Um, well, no, I got a home button. Well, the, the haptic home button, but I got a button. Restart you your iPhone 8 or earlier. Press and hold the power button, either top or side. Uh, no, 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 that, hang on. We got to force restart it. If your iOS device restart, no, 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 no. This isn't the right thing. Yeah, 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 this is this article is not this article is telling us what to do if the phone is responsive, uh, not if it's not responsive. So we will. Oh, OK, well, no, I did see in the chat room. So the thing is, if you hold the power button and the volume down, you will then get the screen that prompts you to power down or do an emergency SOS or cancel. All right. right. But my phone was beyond that. Okay. My phone would not do that. That's correct. Yes. But but my phone would was failing at that and it needed the you know, super firmware only thing. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Alan five sixty seven is saying power and volume down is the force shutdown. So I hope that's right. Does that work for you, John power and volume down? Does that just shut it off without bringing up that screen? Uh, not at the moment. Hmm. Okay. We will find a thing. So we don't know what the this conversation went exactly where I didn't want it to go with lots of ideas and the wrong thing to remember. So iPhone 10 and later volume up release volume down release 
hold the power button, the phone will shut off even if it's in an unresponsive state. There you go. That's what we're sharing. When we get the right thing that can be tested and confirmed for the seven and eight, which have the virtual home button, we will share that too. And we'll leave that to you, Mr. Braun, because you have that phone to test it with. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, and if that happens during this episode, we will get there. Steven has a great little tip. He says, have you ever wondered how you would create a Mac OS keyboard shortcut in system preferences keyboard for a menu command when there's another menu command with the exact same name somewhere else in that app? Well, first of all, there shouldn't be, but some app developers do that. He's not wrong. He says there's a way because you can specify the full path using air quotes to the menu command by putting dash greater than with no spaces between the menu command titles that may make sense when you see it, but it is by no means obvious. So you would do like, let's say you wanted, he said he used Devin think as an example, he wanted to go to file new window inbox. So file menu, go to new window, and then there's an inbox option there. File dash greater than new space window dash greater than inbox matching the capitalization and the spacing used by those names. And that will do it. So this is a cool thing. It, you, what you may not know is that you can do this for any menu command. You can create a shortcut, even if the app developer did not create one. And that's a really handy thing. And as we indicated, and as Steven indicated, you do that in system preferences keyboard, which is pretty, pretty darn cool. All right. Good. Yes. Good. You want to take us mm-hmm. to Seth, Mr. Braun? Uh, yeah. Let me just paste the link to this handy dandy article I found, which is called Restart Your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch. Okay. It tells you what to do. Great. Confirms what we uh, speculated. So, What does it confirm? And have you tested it? Well, it says how to restart. Uh, for eight or earlier, press and hold the top or side button until the power off slider appears. Drag the slider to turn. Yeah, your we told we there. Stop, stop, stop. We already talked about this. If the slider appears, your phone is not in the frozen state. Right. Right. So the question is, how do you? We already talked ah, about. And how then to do it. there's a and then there's a follow up article on the bottom. It says if your iOS device is frozen or won't turn on. So. Okay. This article contains a link to an article that tells you more. On the iPhone 8 or later, you do exactly the same thing that you do on the iPhone 10, which is volume up, release, volume down, release, mm-hmm. press and hold the side button until you see. So it's the same thing for the iPhone 8, as you mm-hmm. speculated. iPhone 7 is you press and hold the power button as well as the volume down button for 10 seconds until you see the Apple logo. There you go. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Okay. So yeah. these articles should uh, have you covered. All right. Where are we now? You're going to take us to, um, uh, I, I can get the agenda up. A small screen. There you go. With lots of links. Ah, going to take Seth. us to Seth. All right. Sweet. Yeah, we got a good, yeah. Seth has a, a good one here. That kind of makes sense. Um, Recently, I had a logic board die in my MacBook Air running Mojave. After replacement, my iMessages, or messages now, I guess, um, were no longer syncing to iCloud on my MacBook Air. Hmm. So I went into the Messages app, Preferences, Accounts, to find the setting, Enable Messages in iCloud, except it wasn't there. Not grayed out, just missing completely. Yeah. All right. Uh, after some hunting, it turns out that following the logic board replacement, keychain syncing in iCloud had been disabled by the system. After turning it on, the option for message syncing reappeared. This might help someone else looking for an option that seemingly disappeared. Okay. That's a good one. And I, I, I imagine that this happens because on, on a lot of uh, systems mac and pc and all that they sometimes use some unique information like maybe the mac address of your ethernet or your wi-fi to create keys and encrypt stuff and so i think that's probably why this happened of course it's not very nice that they kind of hid (laughs) that the option had just disappeared that's 
kind of nasty. So thank you very much for that tip. That's uh, that's good stuff. He said he's running a MacBook Air. I wonder if that's a 2018 or 2019 MacBook Air with a T2 chip, because that would also make sense, right? Because the oh, T2 right, chip right, right. has the key in it. Like you don't you don't get the key anywhere else. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I don't know. But that's, you know, that T2 chip is, is I, I think it's a good thing, but it comes with some caveats that you have to understand, you know, that it's, it's going to, it's going to control some things in a way that is, um, it, well, is new really is what it, what it comes down to. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's good. Fun. All right. Uh, next Dave. Next. I guess I could. I want to, you can, and I want you to talk about your Apple card, uh, because you got one and we all, what what did I post on Facebook? Congratulations, John, for getting your Apple card. There you go. (laughs) I first want to talk about our next sponsor though, which is Linode. Please. Yeah. At linode.com slash M G G where Promo code MGG2019 gets you a $20 credit. Linode is so cool. You are going to need a server for something. If not right now, probably soon. You know, we're geeks here. We And honestly, even if you're not a geek, for our businesses and stuff, we need a website you know, to host things, we might want to run like a Minecraft server. We might run a run like a... You know, all kinds of things, right? And you need a server in the cloud. This is what Linode does. And what's cool about Linode is every single server, even starting with their $5 a month Nanode server, runs on SSDs. So we know the big difference that SSDs made to even our Macs that are 10 years old. The CPU is often not the issue. It's the disk speed. And with SSDs, you don't have that issue, which means that even running on their $5 a month plan, you're still getting that same fast SSD speed, which can make a huge difference for like your WordPress site and getting all that stuff running. If you like the command line, Linode will give you, you know, root access on your virtual server and you're good to go. If you don't like the command line, they have all these quick start things. So let's say you want a WordPress site. You just go in, you say, I want a WordPress site. They ask you a few questions like, you know, what do you want it named? Do you have a password you want to use? And then it sets up all the stuff you need so that you don't even need to worry about like Apache and MySQL and all that. Just sets it up and says, okay, here's the address. Here's the login. Go. And you've got WordPress up and running in seconds, maybe minutes. So you got to check it out. Go to linode.com slash MGG. Use promo code MGG2019. And our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. Now, congratulations, Mr. Braun. You were able to order and even get now, I think, your Apple card. So tell us about this mythical device. Yeah, so here, so here's the experience. Um, so they announced it back in March, and you can go to uh, Apple's website, and they have a uh, uh, you know a page that talks about the card, and then they have a little thing that says notify me when it's available. So it's like kind of a pre-release. So the thing is, it's not yet officially quite released because I still see that button on the page. Um, but the thing is, Dave, you know what? Some work is best done at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is. I requested an invite <clears throat> using the notify me thing, and you want to enter the Apple ID of the device that's going to utilize the card. Sure. Um, and so I did that. And the thing is, I requested it last Tuesday, and I got the invite on Wednesday. <laughs> it's like, what did I do to deserve this? I don't know if I have a friend at Apple or something, because there were people that, that were shaking their fist at me saying, you know, I requested this back in March and I still haven't gotten the invite and you got it in a day. And it's like, well, you know, are you sure you didn't put your name in when they announced it at WWDC? Like, because I know a lot I'm of almost people certain I did. did not. OK. All right. Because that's possible. No. I mean, you know, who knows? Yeah. No, not that good. So anyways, um, and then what happens is you, uh, so what's going to happen is once it's rolled out, um, the way you request one is you go into wallet, you hit the plus sign, 
And what you're going to see is uh, probably a couple of different things. You're going to see credit or debit card or what I saw because I got the invite was Apple card. And it's like, oh, well, that's cool. Okay. So, um, you know, clicked on Apple card to add that. And then it asked a few questions. So it's like, uh, all right, here's what I think your first and last name are. Uh, please tell me your birthday. And um, <clears throat> what else did it have? And, and your phone number, which duh, it knows that because it's it's on the phone. Um, here's the thing. So if you happen to be someone like John F. Braun, what I did is I changed my first name to John space F so that the card has John F. Braun on it. So if you want to put your middle initial in, and that this works with a lot of other systems that don't explicitly ask um, for your middle initial, because I want it there, because all my other cards have it. So anyways, and then uh, I think it confirms your mailing address, because you may want to get the physical version of it. And then it asks your income. And um, between us, uh, you can pretty much, uh, from people I know in the banking industry, you can pretty much make up a number, but I didn't. Um, it, you and then, can, but... They can also cancel your card agreement if uh, if you provided yeah. incorrect or false information on your application. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Know. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, um, you know. So there you go. Uh, so anyways, and so I provided that and then don't get caught. It basically um, did a uh, did a check and it says, OK, well, you know, here's here's your limit and here's your. Uh, Here's the interest rate, and I got the lowest interest rate because, uh, like you, Dave, I'm a credit superstar. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's great. And then the card was added to my wallet. It's like, wow, that, 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 that's pretty neat. And at that point, you could have started using it for Apple Pay purchases, right? Like right Correct, at that moment. Because okay. I, it, right. Um, I didn't do that until the next day, but I did, and it, sure. it worked just like any other card. So you didn't have to wait to receive your physical card in the mail to start using it. Correct. Cool. Now, but you did get your physical card in the mail today, if I saw correctly. Is that right? Right. Now, the other thing I want to mention... Oh, okay. So here's the other thing, though, you want to be aware of. Um, and we talked a bit about this. Um, I was on the uh, on Kelly's uh, on gig a, a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yes. Um, Make sure now. I don't have this, but some people who are concerned about their credit or fraud may have their their credit file frozen, which means that if anybody asks anything, it's going to say no. So uh, if if your credit and and they check with TransUnion, which I found out because like an hour after I got the uh, card, at least three services that I sign up to all said, "Hey, you just had a hard pull on your uh, mm. on your credit," and I'm like, "Yeah, okay, right, yeah." They didn't have to do it, and I don't know why they did it. But but they did. So just be aware of that. Um, in credit language, uh, you don't want to have too many hard pulls where they make a formal request, in this case to TransUnion, because then it looks like you're desperate for credit and you may not get it. So right. just be aware of that, that you're probably going to get one of these on your record. And also, they didn't do this with me, but they may ask for additional information if they're not sure you are who you say you are, like a scan of a driver's license or something like that. Um, Though so apparently they trusted me. So that was great. So then, yeah. So then you're able to use the um, the digital card. Um, here's the fun part. If you have an Apple Cash card, which is a virtual debit card that you can also have in your wallet, you get daily cash. And it actually deposited like the next day. I made a purchase for like whatever. And uh, because I used Apple Pay, um, I got 2% back right into my Apple Cash card. So that's pretty neat. That's pretty cool. Um, their deal is, so the cashback works as follows. 3% if you buy Apple stuff, 2% if you use Apple Pay, and 1% for everything else, like if you use the physical card. Sure. Um, That's actually a pretty good deal. I, I mean, it's not it's not the stellar deal that you can get if you're maximizing for travel points. Um, depending on how you're doing it, you can definitely do better. But Apple chose simple over best uh, rewards and uh, you know three per well two percent on Apple Pay purchases is pretty good. I mean that's pretty aggressive. Uh, that is because actually I had one card which they stopped the deal, but it was a Wells Fargo card, and they actually offered something similar, but only for a limited time. And then yeah. if you used Apple Pay, you get a little extra bonus cash. So um, 
So yeah, so I think I'll use it for that. So, the now, thing is, so you, you get a, you've gotten it I, now. Now you and I have both held Apple cards. Now um, I, I actually got to hold one at WWDC. I, I don't want to say whose, but suffice to say, I was able to hold an, an Apple card. I, I I found it very. Huh. It's it's metal. It's titanium. It is hefty, but <clears throat> unlike the Amex Black Card or the Visa Black Card which are metal and like could slice skin. Uh, I found the Apple card to be like, like, like delicious to hold it rounded edges. And like, was mm -hmm. that, are you finding the same thing with the with production ones? Oh yeah. I, I, I used it in a couple of places and one people were like, wow, this thing's kind of heavy for a credit card. Yeah. I'm like, well, it's metal. And they're like, Oh, okay. And I'm like, Hey, check this out. See the number on it? And they're like, no. I'm like, yeah, there isn't one. Right. <laughs> so from a security standpoint, that's kind of cool. Now, if you want the number, and this card, in addition to the virtual, does have it, you, you can go into the wallet app, and it will give you the 16-digit number. It begins with a five because it's a MasterCard. Sure. I don't know if anybody knew that, but the first digit of a credit card typically indicates the issue, the, the, the which group it belongs to. Um and the CCV and all that stuff there. So if you need that information, it is in the wallet app. So if you want to buy something and they want, um, and they don't integrate with Apple, you know, Apple Pay or your phone, then um, you you can get that information. I don't think in person anyone should ever ask you for that. Just so you know, they should no. they, they should, but they well, yeah, it'll no. be I'm so curious. so the uh, so the card was interesting. So so it came by a FedEx. Um, hmm. Uh, popped it open in a FedEx envelope, and then it was in a cardboard box, and then it was in a container. So here's an interesting thing. This is, I've never activated a card like this. Most cards, when you get them, you got to dial up a phone number and then enter, you know, the number of the card, and uh, then they're like, okay, your card's activated. Otherwise, uh, in theory, you won't be able to use it. Um, here's how it works with the Apple card. The packaging that it's in actually has a tiny little, and if you look on my Instagram, you'll see I took a picture of it, and I know you saw it, and a lot of other people did, Dave. There's a tiny little RFID chip in the packaging. And so what you do is you run the wallet app, you say activate card, and then you hold it near the packaging, and then, uh, I don't know if it's Bluetooth or whatever, but it then sees... Well, you said it's RFID. Yeah, so it's RFID, yeah, but okay. I don't know what... I don't know if it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever. I, I, I or NFC. But, but it's it probably NFC. Really matter. I would guess it's NFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably yeah. Right. So it doesn't really matter. But this is how you activate this card: is you hold the phone near the packaging that has this little little radio in it, and then it's like, oh, okay, all right, you you can now use your card. And I used it. So um, it has both uh, uh what is it? Uh, it has a chip in it, but it also has a mag stripe, so you can use it in places okay. that um. I was wondering about that because I don't think I've seen a picture of the back of the card. So uh, for for people that still haven't gotten hip to the the uh, chip thing, you can it, it does have a mag stripe. Cool. So, uh, though a lot of uh, uh, merchants are discouraged from using that, and apparently there's a liability issue if you still insist on using a mag stripe versus the chip or Apple Pay or something. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You're, so that's you're, the good news. So, as a merchant, you're more on the hook for fraud. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, so there's the good news. So I bought stuff with it. I got the cash back. Everything's great. I got the physical card. It works great. Here's the bad news. And here's, a, I, don't, I don't think it entails a fish shake, Dave, but maybe a finger wag. Um, there's no web interface to this card. I heard With that all like my you other... can't link to Quicken or or Mint or any of those things. So for yeah. for now, right, um, right. So the thing is, every other card that I have, as I'm sure you do, Dave, you can go to a website, whether it's City or Amex or, or Capital One or whatever, and you can access your your card data. And as you pointed out, um, there are services like Mint and and others that um, will go to the site on your behalf and scrape your data and warn you and you know keep track of your stuff that is currently not an option with this card the only way you can see your transaction data is through the wallet app on your uh device that's a drag i i'm with you that would that would actually keep me from using it i mean i'll get one and and it's fine and it's good to have 
uh, uh, appropriately have open credit. So I'll, I'll have it and probably won't use it a whole lot because of that, because I track all my stuff. I still use Quicken, you know, and I'm using Quicken 2019. I, I'm really like, I've been a Quicken user for a very long time. They went through a dark period. I'm not going to lie about that. I stayed mm-hmm. with them because all my data was there and I only had to use it once a month. But now it's freaking awesome again. So a Quicken 2019 for the Mac is great. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. Now, based on, I'll say, sources, um, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> um Goldman Sachs is working on this. Oh, they're, they're aware it's an issue, but I, uh, I, I don't know if I can entirely blame them for not making this a priority for the launch. Well, well it's not maybe, even launched maybe I yet. Will. Right? I mean, that's the other thing. Is it's? I mean, you've right. got a pre-release ish, whatever you want to call it. You, you've got an, uh, you've got an early access to this, right? You, you were blessed by someone somewhere. So, and it may have right. been right. I'm seeing and other, it may not have been, but yeah, yeah. I'm still. I mean, my getting approved in a day, I'm just like, huh? Yeah, <laughs> so, that's great. So yeah, some something happened somewhere. I don't know if they pre-screened me and are like, oh yeah, this guy is like a credit rock star. So yeah, let's send maybe, an invite. Maybe we or have like, a, oh, it's a friendly listener. Who knows? Well, they could have been, oh my gosh, this is John Braun. I mean, oh yeah. wow. better. I mean, there, you know, it, it's, it would be one of those <laughs> listeners and, and, and we know you exist that, that, you know, likes John a little bit better than me and that's okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'm still waiting for so, mine though. Nudge, so nudge, overall- wink, wink. Overall, a very pleasant experience. I just hope that um, that the only thing lacking is the access to the transaction data. Mm. So, um, if if and when they get that, then I would say this is uh, and and just the the model that they have. So here's the other nice feature of the card, Dave: no fees, right? No late fees, no yearly fee, right? Uh, there's no there's no fees. There's no fees if, if you if if you don't pay like a lot a lot of companies and i've had this happen a couple of times and you may have too is that you know for whatever reason i didn't make a payment on time oops my bad and they'll charge me like you know a 25 dollars late fee yeah. or something like that or and sometimes you know if you're a good customer and you say you know can you can you make this go away they're like yeah okay this one time we will um but in this case they they don't they, there's no late fees you, oh you still pay interest of course you still pay interest I mean, they will charge you interest. Um, One thing I use my online like access, like my Amex account or my city account or whatever, you know, for my various credit cards. One thing I use that for is to set up auto pay so that on the due date, if I've forgotten or am traveling or whatever, it's going to make the minimum payment from my checking account on the due date so that I'm not not only I mean, it's one thing to not get a late fee, but it's also one thing to not have a late payment noted on your credit report. And I guarantee you that at some point, maybe not on the first one, but at some point, even if Goldman Sachs isn't charging you late payment fees, they are most definitely reporting those missed payments on your credit report. I mean, my understanding is. So there's no way to do auto pay. Oh no, there is no oh, absolutely. Okay. You can schedule oh. you can schedule payments from within the app as yeah, no, well. No, but I want it to auto pay my minimum on the day due, even if I've done nothing. Like that's to me is auto pay. From what I can see, that they will allow that. Okay. Yeah. So if I go under, so number one, you got to put in. So the thing is, I, I use Discover for my bill pay. So, um, so you can you can uh, uh, input a a bank. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, you put in the routing number and the account number and stuff like that. And like in my case, so I punch it in and it's like, oh, that's Discover Bank. And I'm like, yep. Um, but then here's an option here, Dave, schedule payments. Now, I haven't done it yet. Now, that's the other thing. Their, their okay. payment date is always the last day of the month. So it's predictable. That That's kind of sure. nice. So if I click on scheduled payments, it's going to say, okay. Yeah. And it looks like a, it has the ability. Um, yeah. Basically, pay my bill on this date. Great. So, um, okay. so it looks like you can schedule recurring payments for the balance great that's good okay good uh cool they have well thank you here um oh look at this lock card request replacement card express transit yeah so everything almost everything is managed within the uh wallet app right which, uh is, is kind of weird you know again i'd, li- I'd like a web interface yeah to, to, yeah but this is apple's to thing. this thing it's apple's thing yeah 
So, uh, so it it definitely has some advantages, and uh, and also getting the daily cash back is cool. It's yeah, like, wow, I great. got thirty eight cents on my Apple Cash card. So, so we're good. Cool, cool. That's great. Thank you for going through all that for all of us that um, that have to live vicariously. <laughs> So, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Speaking of living vicariously, I wanted to talk about this um, this visit that I had today at uh, at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. So, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm here in Orlando for Podcast Movement. NASA is speaking on Thursday at Podcast Movement because NASA has a series of podcasts that they do. You might not know that. So, now you know. And that's part of the reason that this visit happened today. So NASA uh, worked with the organizers of podcast movement. They brought, I think, about 20 of us out. Uh, there was an application process for anyone who was interested. It meant flying out a day early. Um, and, you know, you were responsible, obviously, for your own travel and everything. Uh, but they took applications from... Uh, more than 20 podcasters and selected 20 of us. They had us tell them who they were, but then also explain, you know, our interest level and, and, and all of that. And evidently I passed the test, which was freaking awesome. Very, very stoked. Wow. You didn't get caught. I nice. didn't, I know. Well, then when we got there, you know, we, I mean, they told us all the things that we couldn't bring and, and most of it was pretty obvious. Some of it, one thing was, was sort of interesting. We had to wear long pants and, you know, shoes or sneakers that covered your entire foot. And if your pants didn't go all the way down to your shoes, you had to wear socks that, that went up. I think that's because we were climbing or not climbing, but walking around in various spots where there might've been like fire ants or, you know, like other little critters and things like that. But today was one of toxic gases. Floridians were complaining about the humidity today. So it was, I mean, it was bad. Like, my glasses would fog up walking out of buildings and things like that. So anyway, it was all worth it. Um, we got to see one of the three remaining Saturn V rockets. That's where I mentioned my my phone went through its its little snip fit earlier today that I fixed. And then we got to see some really cool things. We got to see uh, Launch Pad 39B, which is NASA's launch pad that NASA uses for NASA's stuff. Launch pad A is where the SpaceX Falcon takes off from. So this was pretty cool, right? I had been there. The last time I was there was probably, you know, almost 40 years ago, maybe 35 years ago. And I, when I was there, I remember seeing the space shuttle being moved on what they call a crawler to one of the uh, one of the launch pads. Uh, what's really cool is, you know, NASA... And as with many things, and the Internet is also a great example of this, you know, NASA was essentially is tasked with creating things and developing technology that would be nearly impossible to expect, you know, private industry to create. But then once created, sort of hand it off and say, hey, private industry, take over. And that has happened. Right. And and it was really cool to see, it, you know, the Artemis project, which is the new um trips to the moon, one of uh, which should go uh, in 2020. I think there's no humans on the 2020 launch. There's humans on the 2022 launch and then going to the moon on the 2024 launch. But so that's happening right at NASA. And then simultaneous with that is this commercial enterprise, right? SpaceX is there and Blue Origin and all that stuff. So it's like it's happening so much so they call Kennedy Space Center a, this blows me away, John, a multi-user spaceport. And that's what it is. So it's really, I, like, that sort of blew me away. I mean, I knew of all this stuff. I actually didn't know as much about Artemis as I should have. But um, but I'm certainly aware of, of it and certainly aware of SpaceX doing their thing. But, you know, that concept of multi-user spaceport, like, that's actually what's happening. And the Artemis thing, they're using so much of it to test uh, what they can do for Mars missions because, you know, it takes three days to get to the moon. It takes six months to get to Mars. So they're doing all this stuff to see about like plants growing so that they don't have to bring all their food with them when they go to Mars. Like what can they do? And all this deep space sort of research, they're using the moon as this test bed so that they 
kind of, you know, work some of the kinks out when it's a, you know, one week turnaround, essentially, as opposed to a one year turnaround to get to Mars. Uh, very, very cool. I And I, I got to see the... Um, one of these crawlers that that brings things from the vehicle assembly building where they sort of stack the rockets together and then it moves it moves at one mile an hour john these crawlers do and they crawl from the well, they're kind of they're kind of big though i, I don't think uh they're six million pounds too- yeah <laughs> yeah I don't think you want something that big moving too quickly. No, no. And and we talked, I got to talk to two of the drivers. There are eight people that are, I don't want to say they're certified um, because I don't think anybody's certified to drive one of these, but there's eight engineers that uh, are, are the ones who drive the crawler. And what's really cool about them, John, is, you know, these guys, and it's all men right now, although there is a woman sort of being trained to drive the crawler, but all of these people went to school and became engineers and then the, the, and they said it's the best engineering job in the world because not only do you get to design the stuff, you also get to be part of building it. And not only do you get to design it and be part of building it, you are the one that gets to use it. So like, where else do you get to be an engineer that you're actually the one using the thing that you designed and helped build? Like it's, they said, it's great. One guy was there. I think he'd been there 38 years and another guy was there 32 years. So these are, these are jobs that people tend to keep. And yeah, they said that crawler moves at one mile an hour. It burns uh, gas at the rate of 32 feet per gallon. So, yep. Uh, there are 400. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Not a mileage champ. All right. uh, no, no. But but they say it's interesting. They say there's about 25 people working on it uh, as it's driving. And it's a constant conversation on the headsets. It takes about you know, seven hours to get the thing from the VAB, the vehicle assembly building, which is sort of the the thing that you think of when you see Kennedy space center, like that building with the flag on it and stuff. Um, And then it, it takes about seven hours to get it to the launch pad and they wouldn't want it to go any faster to your point. Like the drivers are like, Oh no, 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 no. It requires a lot of conversation. They work in two hour shifts and they're, they're constantly talking you know, about, okay, how there's people on the outside measuring how far they are from either edge so that they can stay straight. And it's this constant, you know, thing where they're just tweaking and nudging and tweaking and nudging. Nope. So what is it using for fuel? I mean, do they just diesel. pull up to the gas station and say, oh, okay, it is. Well, the- <laughs> it's diesel and they have um, uh, generators that are doing some electric, but it's, it's, yeah, it's diesel. Yeah. 32 feet per gallon. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking they pull up to the gas station. And it's yeah, like, no, no. Yeah, just give get, give us all you got. <laughs> no, and they, in fact, they they it's built. It holds. I think there's. Oh, I wanted to say five uh, five tons of fuel on it. I, I forget. Uh, no, they, they they I I I didn't take a a no. It's that's that's wrong. Maybe it's uh, I forget. Anyway, they've got enough fuel. They've got two tanks on there, and they've got enough fuel to get out and back. So there is no midway refueling. Uh, of the of the crawler and there's also no stopping i mean sometimes they have to stop very very temporarily and then can continue but if they start the day uh th- and they start moving the crawler they will not stop the crawler will either make it and the the stack will be transferred to the launch pad or it goes all the way back to the vehicle assembly building it is not left overnight uh on the thing if like if something happens to the crawler or whatever because they you know they've got this huge very very expensive rocket out there teetered up on this thing and you know not protected from lightning where it is protected in the assembly building and also protected on the launch pad because they have these arrays of of lightning you know distribution um but uh but yeah so it they have to which is why the engineers are the ones that drive because if there's a problem everybody that helps you know, build the thing from soup to nuts is there to figure out the solution and move it. And these are the same crawlers that they built for Apollo back in what, you know, 65 or something. So like these things were well designed, uh, over-engineered perhaps. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Lightning. Yeah. I remember, man, you know, some of the best lightning storms I saw were in or when I vacationed in Orlando. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I saw one today, man, like driving back from there, 
uh, it's, it's about an hour from, from where I am here. I'm just on the other side of the airport uh, at this, whatever the Rosen Shingle Creek resort, wherever podcast movement is here. And it, um, yeah, it took, uh, it was pretty cool. I got to stand underneath one of these crawlers. I mean, it like we got access to things that most people don't get to do. It was really, really special. Very, very cool. What, what, it, and it's cool. What, I mean, it's cool what I got to do, but it's also really cool what NASA's doing. And, and that's why they did this. They, they, they wanted, they want to build some awareness for what's happening there because it's the public that funds this and, you know, they're well aware of that. So they want to make sure people know what they're doing and hopefully then want to support it. But step one is they don't want to know what they're doing. So they said, John, they took out 300 miles of copper cable and replaced it with fiber throughout Kennedy Space Center in the in the past, whatever the, the past renovations, wherever that, you know, whenever that happened, which is crazy. There's also 6000 gators there, just in case you want to wander around, not only would security maybe get you, but the gators might get you first. So yeah, there you go. Craziness, huh? Mr. Braun. All right. Yeah. Well, we, we have got, a couple we more, a we have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, they want to do, they want to do this stuff again. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have a couple more questions. I want to talk about our, our next sponsor first, which is bare bones, uh, BB edit at barebones.com. John, I have BB edit running on my MacBook air right now. Because it's where we process the show notes. Uh, it's where I do comparisons of text. It's where I edit files for, you know, our PHP files for Mac Observer. Uh, it, it's where I do everything. I count words. I convert and make sure that before I paste text in somewhere that it is plain text because BB edit will only give you plain text, even though when you're in like some PHP file or an HTML file on the screen, it formats the text so you can see it and it makes functions sort of highlighted. So they're easy to see, but that's only on the screen. The files are always, always text. You got to check this out. If you're not a BB edit user, Go become one. Go to barebones.com, download BB Edit. You can download it for free. You get a 30 day free trial of all the features. And then when that trial ends, you have the free version of BB Edit, which has lots of features, not all of the features, but lots. And frankly, for what we do, they might be enough for you. So go check it out. Barebones.com, our thanks to Barebones uh, and the BB Edit team for sponsoring this episode. All right. Let's go to James here, John. We'll get a little theoretical. I figure that's appropriate after we uh, that after we talked it, about NASA. That was my thought when I saw this question: is that uh, we get to we get to, there's no get, right answer. No, there's no there's wrong a strategy. Answer. Yeah. So James says I have a few questions for you regarding network speed. Uh, number one: How much internet speed does the average person really need these days? Number two: Should internet speed be looked at? as household total for what you need for everyone combined versus trying to get the maximum speed per device. Like, do I really need one gigabit per second internet just for my MacBook? Or should it be looked at as to how much devices are filling up the pipe of saying 100 megabit, 300 megabit or higher, like five devices streaming up to 30 megabits per second? He says, I think Netflix 4K tops out at 25. That's correct, I believe. Question three, should your network speed match your internet speed for all your devices. So this is your internal network speed versus your external, you know, internet LAN versus WAN. And number four, do you think I made the right decision based on my needs? Uh, and he chose, I'm looking here. He said he was on a 300 megabit per second plan and downgraded to 150 megabits per second uh, with unlimited data. He says he has two kids, six and eight years old, that watch Netflix and YouTube videos and play a little Minecraft on their iPads. He streams 4K Netflix on one TV in the house and 1080p on the other. And they stream Spotify on their phones and do the random downloads and those sorts of things. Um, he says, uh, well, we'll leave it at that. So I think for... What I got a quick answer, Dave. Yeah. If everything's working... You're good. You know what? That's <laughs> the speed that you have is the right speed for you. Uh, except I, I will, in the back of my mind, I, I was trying to think of this as like a system level analysis here. Okay. The only thing is, so one, you have your 
real-time services, whether they be streaming, whether it be gaming or Netflix or, or you know, spot. So video takes some pipe. I think gaming doesn't really take a lot of pipe, and I think audio takes very little pipe. Okay. Concur with me? I I, um, I I researched this at one point. Are, I don't think you ga- are right in terms of bandwidth, but gaming yes, in terms of bandwidth. Gaming, I'll put a big asterisk on because if your pipe is too okay. small, even though the game itself or too slow. Well, I mean, well, no. It, go, I mean, go. I mean, tell, tell me because pipes, I, you, you it, pipes are speed, right? So right. slow, small, same thing, right? So if your pipe is, if your pipe speed is too low and everything is soaking up the, the, uh, the data, you know, the amount of, of data that you have, the, the speed that you have, then your, all your data is left in a queue, right? So if you're downloading a bunch of stuff and you're waiting for data from like somewhere up, like say your email or something, it's going to get in line behind all the data that's coming in. Similarly, anything that's going out, if you're using all of that to upload to your online backup or, you know, iCloud photos or whatever, things are going to get in line. Games do not like to be in line. And especially if you're playing those twitchy games where, you know, your first person Mm -hmm. shooters and all that stuff, you want the moment you do something, you want everybody that you're playing that game with online to, know it and when when they do something you want to know it so you need to have enough okay. headroom in your pipe right in order for the games minute little bits of data to get in and out real real fast and there's some routers that are actually built to prioritize games and actually lots of them are you can sort of tweak that stuff so that's the asterisk that i would put on games for you john yeah okay the the only thing I could think outside, uh, so if all your services are responsive enough, whether it be mm-hmm. audio or video or gaming, then you got the right speed. The, the only thing I could think is that if you're doing a lot of moving about of data, like huge downloads and stuff like that, it may be worth you getting a bigger pipe. Now, the thing is, I, I mean, every now and then, like, you know, for example, I think the biggest thing that I download re- on a regular basis is Xcode. <laughs> Yeah. Whenever they update it. Yeah. And sure. that usually gets on the order of gigabytes. And it, it takes a while sometimes. It's not instant because it's it's a big file. Right. What do I have? I think I have two hundred. For me I think I have two hundred down, thirty five up, and, and that that works for as a single person here, but with lots I w- of devices, I would be f- I had two hundred down and ten up, which is what Comcast offers, right? And the 200 down was totally fine, even for me being a geek, right? Like, certainly there were times, like you said, when you're doing some big download like Xcode or, you know, an operating system download or whatever, where it, you know, you, I mean, you see that it's using the maximum of your speed. That's great. But it was never too slow. Where for me, it was too slow was that 10 megabit upstream finishing a podcast and, you know, I'm recording at least three podcast episodes a week. We do this one. I do gig gab. I do small business show and I'm the one doing the recording and, the, and then, you know, sending it off to Alphonic to do our post-production and that 10 megabit upstream was killing me. And so I called Comcast and I'm like, is there anything you can do to increase my upstream? They're like, yeah, we can get you to 40 if you, uh, or maybe 35 is what they advertise. It comes in at like 42 or something, but they're like, yeah, we can get you to whatever 35, uh, if you go to our gigabit plan, it's like, OK, sure. So that's why I have the gigabit plan. I honestly see very there are very few moments where I notice the difference other than doing a speed test. And it's like, oh, yeah, look, gigabit, Ooh. you know, 200. I think 200 is a good number for most people. Again, there's no way for us here to say that without knowing a whole lot more about your your own scenario, except like you said, John, if it works. Don't worry about it. You're good to now, go. But you bring up an interesting point is that so for most, uh, I think both DSL and cable are what I'm going to call asymmetrical, at least in in the nature of the down versus up, is that they're not the same number. Right. Almost never the same number. Whereas right. fiber, I think, typically will advertise that you get the same up and down. That's and symmetrical I, I, for fiber, asymmetrical, like you said, for cable. and Yeah. And I will tell you... Th- but you bring up a good point in that the upstream is probably more important for most people, as you pointed out. I mean, you're uploading content. I mean, you know. Well, but they're, we they're, all they're, are. That's the thing, John, is it's like, yes, I'm doing it for a very specific thing with the podcast. But as soon as I did that, 
we all noticed that things got easier to use and it had nothing to do with going from 200 to a thousand on the down. It had everything to do with going from 10 to 35 right. or 40 on the up because we're all, you know, our phones, we take pictures with them. What happens? They blast up to iCloud. We have online backups. What happens? Well, they got a backup. That's all using the upstream. I really think what you have 200 down and 40 up would be what I would call a minimum power user, power home connection where you've got, you know, I mean, you really, you should have 200, 200, I, I, you know, but most of us can't get that. Uh, so a realistic number is what you've got 200 down 40 up. Unfortunately, most I think people, it's only 35, well, 35, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. that, that range, uh, most people can't get that. Most people are on Comcast, right? That's the, the biggest provider in the U S and in order to get more than 10 up, you've got to go to the gigabit plan. So that that's the only reason I would suggest considering gigabit if you're with Comcast is to get that, you know, 30 megabit plus upstream. Um, now, to jump to his second question, does your internal network speed need to match your external network? Now, of course, if we're all using Ethernet, we're probably on gigabit Ethernet. So even at gigabit speeds, your internal network is going to be as fast as, as you know, or faster than your external. And that in a, in a perfect world, that's what you want. You don't want your internal network being your bottleneck. However, for most of us, our internal network is some kind of a bottleneck because we all use Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi doesn't go gigabit. I know it says it does. It doesn't for most of us especially using iPhones and MacBooks, we're using what are called two by two Wi-Fi devices. And you're going to get even on 802.11 AC, you're probably real world looking at somewhere 400 megabits per second. I mean, I've seen 500 real world. 400 is a, a better like maximum. And really, unless you're sitting right on top of the router, you're more in that 200, maybe even less, like somewhere between 175 and 300 megabits range. So if you've got gigabit, your Wi-Fi devices definitely will not get the full speed of that gigabit download. So just bear that in mind. If all, if all your devices are on Wi-Fi, you probably don't care whether your speeds are gigabit or not. Even on Ethernet, I mean, for what most of us do, you probably don't care. So. I mean, yeah. the other thing to consider, um, and I think you've pointed this out, but um, you know, some of the newer Wi-Fi, single Wi-Fi uh, uh, routers um, are kind of can be smart about allocating bandwidth to devices, and I think uh, to, to bring it to the next level, a mesh system will. It, uh, I think is even better because then it distributes the uh, the load among you know different access points, so you don't have you know a a, a single choke point, if you will. That's right. Uh, or limiting factor. Yeah, that's right. And that you know when when you talk about uh, you know his scenario here where you've got multiple people streaming simultaneously, if they're doing that on Wi-Fi, even if you don't have coverage issues, mesh can still be a big help because exact because of exactly what you said, John, where it can distribute the load to different access points. And that can, that can really help because generally speaking, if we're using Apple gear, your Wi-Fi devices are only speaking one at a time. We do not have multi-user MIMO on Apple gear yet. We don't know if we ever will, <laughs> but, but the mesh gives you that without having to have it built, built into the, your devices. So, Yeah. Alan in the chat room, Alan 567 in the chat room asks, does Eero have any tools to tell you that you are saturating your connections? They do not. But Eero is one of the few mesh vendors that has protection against what we call buffer bloat. They call it SQM, uh, uh, queuing management. I don't know why I can't remember what the S stands for there, but sequential. No, no, it's not. Uh, but that that is the Eros SQM is will do exactly that. It will make sure that you're not 
saturating your connection and causing that problem that would cause games to have have issues other things will have issues too but that that whole thing with um buffer bloat maybe it's smart i think i think you're right steven 23 in the chat room i think it's smart oh smart yeah i think that's right okay yeah so yeah yeah it's good well you know that the the, you know the the something in the back of my head i'll just spit it out so how do you tell how much pipe all of your things are using. And I'm glad you mentioned Eero, Dave, because I, I, I was doing this the other day. I think when I was uh, looking at my 4K uh, uh, streaming connection, how do you know how much bandwidth all your devices are taking? That's not an easy task, unless you have something. So fortunately, the Eero software will show you the upload and download of your various devices. I'm not sure. I, I think you mentioned a tool. So if you don't have an Eero, but I think certain routers may be able to report this information um, to yes. help you understand. Yeah. Eero is certainly not the only like. one, but, but they are one of them. That's right. Yep. But I thought there was a general purpose tool. I think it's kind of geeky that you mentioned at one point that'll show you the, the, the bandwidth that all, all the devices connected to the network are using, whether they be wired or wireless. And Eero does a great job of this. And, you know, I've used it at times. I'm like, wait, how much bandwidth is, is this connection taking? And you know, like, for example, my Netflix, I'm like, is it really taking the bandwidth it says? And it's like, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. it is. That's yeah, good. yeah, yeah. My Synology router, the RT2600 AC will, will do that too. So it, it really has to happen at the router level unless you have some kind of box that's, you know, standing in the way of that uh, to, to do it. But but generally, it's got to be the router. I mean, there there is, if you have a router that supports SNMP, which there are fewer and fewer of, you could use multi-router traffic graph or uh, MRTG mm. to, to do it. But that's, that's, that's so yeah. far off the map these days that, it, I mean, I'm sure there's some of you using it, but that I would definitely not recommend even trying to pull on that thread. Just get a router that, that will do it uh, internal to the router. There's many of them. I think, most Linksys routers will certainly the Netgear routers will do that. The Synology, as I mentioned, Eero. Uh, I, I think the new Deco firmware does that from TP Link. Like there's, it's a pretty common thing these days because just like you said, John, it's finding that information otherwise is near impossible. So Asus will do that as Brian Monroe in the chat room points out. Yeah, thanks. It's good. All right. Um, I'm trying to think if there is one quick, well, you know what we have, we have uh, a couple of tips that might make sense to go through. This is what I get for prepping the show moments before and uh, not really reading through everything. So we're going to do Todd's tip and I don't know uh, how long this one's going to take, but Todd says, uh, I picked up the Eero Pro 3-pack on Amazon Day, uh, Amazon Prime Day for $2.99. That's a win. With the Eero, I now see when devices are added to my network. My son's good friend who lives behind us had his mother's iPad at our house and joined our Wi-Fi. No problem. The next morning, I saw his mother's iMac at his house also join our Wi-Fi. So... Her iPad passed our Eero name and credentials to her iMac via iCloud, because that's how iCloud keychain works. And the Eero in my house next to a rear window is strong enough to reach across our yard and into their house. So her iMac picked it up. Being a geek, I let her know and provided instructions to sort her Wi-Fi list in System Preferences Network Wi-Fi to the top so that she's getting hers and not ours. He says, I just thought the series of events was interesting how the capabilities of iCloud sharing its passwords with iCloud keychain across devices and the power of Eero came together. He says, it's nice that neither she nor I got caught. So thanks for sharing that, Todd. Yeah, that's um, that it's a real it's you know, I mean, it's a first world problem, right? But <laughs> it is it is a thing that will happen for sure. It's good. Yeah. I mean, the cool part is with Eero, you know, I, I was tempted to do this one time when you came to visit. And actually, I hope you got some invites for uh, some events as of late that you're going to come. Yeah, I think we'll there's go some together. Capcom events down in, in September. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Synology also has their uh, deal. Right. Uh, look for that one. Okay, I will look. But um, but I was thinking, uh, so the nice thing about Eero is it gives you the ability to selectively block things. 
That's true. He and I was thinking of doing her, that one time when you came. <laughs> I'm thinking at one point I was going to do that to you and you'd figure out how long it, it would take you to realize that I was, you know, messing with you. Uh, it wouldn't but, take um, that long. And then I then I would have to go up and firmware, <laughs> and, you know, reset your network, which would cause all kinds of headaches for you. But and, and then you'd have to ask me for your password or you'd need to firmware reset your network. This would not be it would be interesting to tell the story. It wouldn't end, yeah. it would, it wouldn't end well for either one of us. But, um, no. But Eero and I think a lot of other systems give you the ability to selectively block specific clients, which, uh, hey, depending on what world you live in, that yeah. you, you may need that. You may, know. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, John. I, I think um, I think we're going to uh, we're going to find the band. I think the band is on vacation here in Orlando. So, oh, no, that's <laughs> the wrong. The band's playing the wrong song. I hit the wrong button. The band's playing the wrong song. So we will uh, we will try this again. Band, are we uh, are we ready to Band just loop? vamp a little bit? Band loop two. Hello. There it is. There they are. They're doing what they need to do. There we go. It's now great. Here. Yeah, much better. Yeah. How could you leave them outside, man? Oh, oh in this heat and, and humidity. And oh, it's gross out there. Yeah. No wonder they were playing the wrong song. You can't really blame them. It's kind of how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen the uh, the love bugs? Uh, no. Okay. No, I don't. I don't. Know no, what when that I is. vacation there, there's a certain time oh. of year when you got these bugs that are uh, very uh, affectionate towards one another, but they swarm like certain areas, oh. and your windshield in your car will be like. Thankfully, no, I these, didn't. These I didn't run into bugs. that. Of course, I when I was driving back tonight, it was pouring rain, so I I think like torrential downpour. Thankfully, mm-hmm. the roads in Florida are mostly just straight and flat. So, uh, you know, it wasn't all that difficult getting back across the state from uh, from the coast. So, yeah. All right. Well, we thank told you for you the listening. email. Yeah, we told you the email. Unless you're a premium listener. And then uh, and then it's premium at MacGeekab.com. And uh, if you want to join, of course, MacGeekab.com slash premium is where you will find that. Uh I want to thank, well, I want to thank all of you for listening. I want to thank everybody in the chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream for doing this. Uh, thanks for dealing with my crazy schedule, Mr. Braun. And I'm glad this seems to have worked. Thanks to Cashfly at Cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our sponsors, as we mentioned in the show, expressvpn.com slash MGG, linode.com slash MGG, barebones software at barebones.com, smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworld computing, maxsales.com. Eero is also a sponsor, uh, not of this episode, but it, it uh, they're an ongoing sponsor. Eero.com slash MGG. Want to help your credit report? Go to Experian.com slash MGG. So much good stuff. And Dave? Yes, John. I got to say, I am so glad, especially with the fact that you were at a government facility. The dog sniffed you... my backpack, John. Like oh. they, they, they had us leave our backpacks on the bus and get off the bus. And they walked a, a, a police officer. Whoa, walked so these up. were like, so these were like, a, a exploding explosive stuffed dogs. I gather. Uh, also looking for other contraband uh, contraband. Yes. Contraband. Wow. Yeah. Well, hey, it's, it's a government facility. And, Absolutely. Uh, no, they had rules. They told us what not to bring. It was like easy enough not to bring it. You just, you know, there you go. Yep. Well, the fact that you're still talking uh, to us, Dave, at this moment in time means that you didn't get caught. Made up.